back in Planten and Blomen uh, Park here in Hamburg about a month after my last um, post I made here on Instagram. And I thought I should elaborate on some of the themes that were brought up last time. I made a case about <coughs> self and one's concept of self, how the Western view of self is that we're foreigners uh, living in a hostile environment, whereas my case was that we are the world, that the whole thing is my body and it's all a perceptual motor experience, like babies learning how to use their own hands. So also when we take ownership of the world, we are students as we learn how it works as opposed to being victims. That's a biggie. I could do a whole thing on that. So when one ceases to be a victim, one becomes a student. And how does one cease to be a victim? Um, one way is to feel good about yourself. Um, I find that if I blame <coughs> blame people for things, thinking they should be different or know better, that in one instance I may experience pain because of them, but in that instance I am sort of their victim because I judge them. So I'm saying life shouldn't be the way it is. <coughs> well, it's the way it is. It doesn't mean it can't change. But uh, when I say you should know better, I'm pretty much taking away their own life because their decisions and their behavior are a sum total of their past experience and, and, and conclusions. The result being that when I stop blaming, compassion takes the place of, of blame. The Buddhists speak of nirvana, which is sort of the awakening from the dream uh, of being a victim, of being in a dualistic world. We won't get into that. But imagine we are no longer victims and become students. It's a lot of fun. Uh, one isn't touched by the pain of the world nearly as much. It certainly is a world full of pain, but it doesn't have to transfer into me. I can be compassionate without being destroyed by it. As I'd said last time, my quest as a person was how to be sensitive in a world that is so brutal oftentimes. <clears throat> and this seems to be the way. A number of things, a number of words exist that are paradoxical from this unawakened state of thinking that we are separate from the world, that our self is independent of the world around it. I should use an example. Um, Stephen Hawking spoke of consciousness, the individual consciousness being like a thunderstorm, that each of us <clears throat> is like a thunderstorm created by the whole universe, by the whole environment. Where does this thunderstorm stop? Where does it begin? Where does it stop? It's a function of the whole of the whole universe, butterfly effect. So with that in mind, how can we say that we are totally separate and the creator of our own consciousness? It's a function of the, the universe. A metaphor I use is being from Kansas and having on occasion, especially in university, sitting on the Kansas River, uh, drinking 3%, 3.2% beer, uh, watching the river flow, this muddy, heavy water full of, of topsoil from, from Kansas flowing down with these incredible eddies that would swirl up into these vortexes and then and then they disappear again. Well, that's, I think, what we're like. We're vortexes that appear and then disappear again. But we're all, it's just a function of the universe. We come and go. <coughs> so another word that, among others, that makes no sense is the word hope. I hope I'll be okay. Well. My feeling is if the universe weren't perfect, 
it wouldn't be here. That it had to be exact, absolutely spot on, or it wouldn't have made it. And since I'm a product of the universe, I'm living in a perfect world, again, full of pain, but uh, in perfection. Let's talk about our concept of perfection. People say things like, in a perfect world, or if the world were perfect, or I'm not perfect. But when I ask people what perfection is, they can't tell me. So they talk about not being perfect with absolutely no idea of what perfection is. Well, I, my feeling is that perfection is an imperfection, is a function of language where our metaphor for something is not the reality. Only metaphors can be destroyed. Uh, only names can be destroyed. Playing a piece perfectly. Mstislav Rostopovich, the Russian cellist, in his 70s finally decided he could play box suites in public. Uh, how good do you have to be? And that's, then mm, good, bad, boy, that's another one. <clears throat> These dualistic words. People speak in terms of perfection related to making mistakes, being mistaken to err and stray like lost sheep, they speak of in the Old Testament, I think. Or is it, I don't know, I'm not Christian, but I used to be a long time ago, I graduated. Um, to err in sheep terms is to wander around looking for grass and you come up to something and it's not grass, well that's erring. But then every now and then it is grass, so then you, you are, are um, rewarded for the search. <clears throat> so to err, to make a mistake, is to be in a process of discovery. Um, if you don't make mistakes, you don't go anywhere. But a lot of people don't go anywhere. Well, why do people do that? I think it has to do with our culture which intrinsically states that if you're a good boy or girl, we'll accept you. If you aren't, you'll be rejected, you'll be shunned. So to be loved and be lovable is to be perfect, is to not make mistakes, to not upset mama and papa. <clears throat> and that's just simply impossible to do. Uh, People talk about imperfection, never perfection. They can't define it. When one leaves the world with judgment and blame, one really sees perfection in the process. You think things were imperfect before humans arrived? <laughs> I don't think so. <clears throat> it makes no sense. I think if you watch my channel, you've seen some of my um, cello playing. <laughs> I started playing cello as a little kid, and then for the last 20, 30 years, really haven't played at all. I played a lot. Went with the American Youth Symphony to Europe when I was 18, etc. But um, I've since acquired a rental cello, and I've been playing quite regularly and really having a good time. And being older, the music I was playing is even richer uh, for my life experience being applied to it. Um, interesting thing about a cello, it's not like a guitar, where you put your fingers on a guitar neck and you're, there's a fret where you put your finger, the tone is always perfectly in tune. Whereas with a cello, wherever you put your finger, that's where the note is. And it is never exactly in the right spot. It's always an approximation. Sometimes it's close enough that you don't notice that it's not quite there, but it's never, in reality, it's never there. Kind of a Mandelbrot thing, but we won't talk about that. So to allow myself to be in a state of constant erring and making mistakes, but really enjoying it is absolutely a gas and to even risk playing in public and being judged and criticized for not being perfect. How dare you play in public? But it's so much fun because it's a discovery and sometimes you get it. <clears throat> What's interesting too is that I can't tell you 
if there's a C, say where is C on this fret, on this fretboard, fingerboard? I couldn't tell you, but I can close my eyes and sit with the cello and find it. It's amazing. Now, I didn't do that. This Adivar called Philip didn't do it. The left side of my brain has no clue, but my right side, side seems to be connected to the rest of my body, the universe. Discovery and creation are painful because you don't quite know where you are, but you are in a state of wonder. What is it? Is the question. There's an old <coughs> Anglican hymn where the refrain goes, and let us not be confounded. And that has to do with things that go bump in the night that may scare you. If I don't know what it is, it's, it could hurt me. So what is it? If you're a fearful person, what is it? You don't want to be in those situations where you're asking what something is because your assumption is that there's something out there to get you if you think you live in this, this hostile, uncaring world. But if you're more secure in yourself, <clears throat> what is it becomes a question unanswered. It's a curiosity. What is it? It's a state of wonder. So wonder versus confoundment, wonder versus fear. Fear and love. I read a book a lifetime ago called Love is Letting Go of Fear <clears throat> by Jerry Jampalski, who I'm, I later met. He did a thing called The Course in Miracles, which has a business up in Marin County Sausalito, north of San Francisco, but I had a sailboat at the time and he came out with his girlfriend and went sailing with me and it was absolutely delightful. And the book was wonderful. It was sort of a crisis book where he made a case for fear existing in the future and love existing in the present. And it made perfect sense. Fear usually has to do with what's going to happen tomorrow. This happened and I give a meaning to it. I think 10% of what happens in the world just happens and 90% is what I make of it. It's what I do with it that determines my life. My father said something similar. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with it that determines who you are and you can take either path. Well, I tend to see the world to be in my favor. I would say I'm pronoid, where I think paranoid is where you think everything's out to get you uh, in hidden ways. And I feel that everything's out in pronoia. Everything is in hidden ways out to help me do what I want to do. And if I don't get it, I get something better. And it's been the case. Next time you're unhappy or afraid, ask yourself why. And I think you'll discover there's nothing there to make you feel that way. When you turn on the light at the top of the basement stairs, you'll see there's nothing down there. But the fact that you were afraid kept you from going down. But when you expose fear by giving, asking its name, what, what is your name? Fear, come, come over here, fear. Usually there's an interesting and actually a good message that it has, but it's been yelling at you for so long and you've been ignoring it for so long that it has, you've given it a horrible face imagining what it is. <clears throat> My metaphor would be to, when I have a fear, is to invite it to come sit by the fire with me and I'll give it a bath and wrap it in a, a nice blanket and put it in my arms and I'll say, what is it you wish to tell me? And really beneath every fear, there is something wonderful uh, that I haven't allowed myself to experience because I gave fear the responsibility of keeping it from me. Uh, and that's a wonderful message. And then it, I can incorporate that in my life without the fear part, but the gift part. 
I'm not sure this is related, but Freud said, beneath every fear lies a desire that it can't, no, beneath every desire lies a fear that it can't be realized. So there's nothing, well, one of the worst things is to have a desire and know you can't have it. And the way people deal with that is to not have the desire to not admit to it, even though it's still hiding in there somewhere. And the more we deny in ourselves, the less we are. <clears throat> in my last little speech with you, I said that my uncle on his deathbed said that he was a collection of his loves. Well, if you aren't allowed to love anything, who are you? Let me show you a little bit more of where I'm sitting. It's really quite nice. So with love, I think we're able to more live in the present, which is where everything's happening. Even fear is projected from the present. The point being that you miss what's going on because you're busy obsessing about something that hasn't happened yet. And to take each moment and keep it clean, to monitor yourself and not think in terms of a timeline I'll be happy tomorrow or be happy now. And how does one do that? And I think it has to do with not seeking outcomes. I mean, can you clean the toilet in a, <laughs> in a joyful way? Can you find some place that feels good? Mama said, make it fun because it's much easier to do. And I re even remember her cleaning the bathroom, singing, go figure.